beautiful time we just had in God's presence, worshiping our great Savior. I mean, wow. Beautiful girls know how to worship. You guys brought it tonight. Man, I just love girls' nights. I hope you do too. Are you sure? That was like not very convincing. But I'm just going to jump right into the word of God tonight because I believe that God has placed a message on my heart that is timely and that is for us as a group and also for us individually. And I want you to know tonight that my heart and my desire for you as your pastor is that God would stir something deep within your soul that would have a lasting impact on your life. I mean, when we gather as beautiful girls and we come together for girls' nights, I mean, we have fun. We always have the snacks and all the pretty decorations. And we love hanging out and enjoying each other. And all of that stuff is great. And it's all important. And it's a part of who we are as a group. But the purpose is to have a life-changing encounter with Jesus. And if we don't meet with Jesus tonight, there's no point. Because you can get a group together anywhere in the world, surrounded about anything, but we are here to worship the King of Kings, and the Lord of Lords, and to open our hearts and surrender to Him. It's January, almost still barely. <laughs> it's barely January. It went by fast, didn't it? But every January is the time of year where we all get out our lists and our goals. Maybe you're like, oh, I don't have New Year's resolutions. I don't either. But I'm always like, I'm going to start doing this this year. Anybody else? How many of you have already stopped doing what you said you were going to do? I am raising my hand. <laughs> it's just a part of the life cycle, right? We wake up January 1st and we're like, you know what? Today is gonna be a new day, it's a new year. I have goals and I'm gonna accomplish something. And those are great. I think it's important for us to focus our hearts at the beginning of a new year. And on our ninth birthday as a church a couple weeks ago, Pastor Ryan said something that I think is so important for us as a group to get into our hearts. He said that 2023, he feels like is a year for our church to grow deeper and to get stronger. So that's what we're gonna do tonight. We're gonna grow deeper and we're gonna get stronger. And in order for us to do that as a group, as a church, you have to take on the personal responsibility of personal growth and of that spiritual growth. So I'm gonna be upfront with you tonight. I don't know if you're new, but we do that around here. Um, <laughs> I'm not playing tonight. I feel like God wants to speak to our hearts. And the message that God has given me is challenging. And that's okay. We're not here for fluff. We're here to grow. And as your pastor, I really do want what's best for you. And what's best is being challenged with the truth of God's word. Now, before we really jump into this, I do want to say one thing. I don't want you to feel condemned tonight, okay? But you might feel convicted. Condemnation is from the devil. It leads us to feel shame and guilt, and it focuses on the past and brings despair. Conviction, on the other hand, is from the Holy Spirit. And it leads us to truth and repentance, and it focuses on the future and brings hope. Amen. Girls, we live in a dark and hopeless world, don't we? And it seems to be getting darker every single day. I do not need to spend any time convincing you of that. We all know that it's true. But we as Christ followers, we simply just have to decide what we're gonna do about it. We live in a dark and a hopeless world and we have to decide what we're gonna do about it. And I think we have three choices. And in spoiler alert, there is only one correct answer. But, 
But we do have three choices, and we all have to make the choice for ourselves. First, we could compromise on the truth of God's word. This is a comfortable choice. It might help you fit in at work. It might help you fit in at school. It might help you fit into the culture. And sadly, we see Christians doing this way too often today. But it it will lead you down the wrong path. And you have to know that once you start compromising on truth, it is a slippery slope. And that is not something that we wanna mess with. Our second option is that we could just hide from it all. Pack up girls, we're moving to the forest. (laughs) With a cabin and a shower. (laughs) That's the only way I do the forest. And this is an option, but it's also a comfortable choice and it's honestly selfish. And it will speed up the spread of evil and godlessness in the world. I'll come back to that in a minute. Or our third choice, which is our only option, is we could fight. We could fight back evil, we could stand on truth, and we can say not on our watch. This is the only option for true followers of Jesus. It's what he has called us to do. Matthew 5, starting in verse 13, says, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt should lose its taste, how can it be made salty? It's no longer good for anything but to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city situated on a hill cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and puts it under a basket, but rather on a lampstand, and it gives light for all who are in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your, God, your Father in heaven. In this passage of scripture, we see how Christians, you and me, are supposed to interact with and function in the world around us. And the answer is, we are to be salt and light and fight against evil. Girls, you are the salt of the earth. Now, salt does the same thing today as it did when Jesus was on the earth. It's salt, this is like not like some tricky phrase to figure out here, he's just talking about actual salt, okay? First, it flavors food. Any salt fans out there? You love salt? Pastor Ryan loves salt. It always offends me like this much when he adds salt to the dinner that I made. (laughs) But I've learned to let it go. In the same way that salt enhances the flavor of food, Christians should enhance the world around them. We should be looking for ways to flavor the world around us and make things better. How can you make your home better for Jesus? How can you make your school, your workplace better for Jesus? That's part of being salt. Another function of salt is it prevents decay. Now we have refrigerators today, thank the Lord. So we don't use salt in this way much anymore, but to Jesus's original audience, this would have been in the forefront of their mind. In ancient times, salt was vital to prevent the decay of food. Salt permeates food and makes bacterial life impossible. Think about that and how it applies to us as Christians. As Christ followers, we do the same thing for the world. We permeate, we pass through every part of the world and we actually fight back decay from happening. Now we look around and we see so much evil. We see so much sin all around us. But imagine how much, how much worse it would be without the influence and strongholds of God-fearing, Bible-believing Christians. Second girls, you are the light of the world. And we should shine the good news of Jesus everywhere we go. 
John 8, 2 says, Jesus spoke to them again, I am the light of the world. Anyone who follows me will never walk in the darkness, but will have the light of life. He's talking about us. He's talking about me, and he's talking about you. We don't walk in darkness anymore. We know hope, we have peace, we understand truth. What does that mean? We have the light of Jesus shining inside of us and we have to let it shine bright. So if you are a follower of Jesus, the facts are that you are the salt of the earth and the light of the world. Jesus said so. And as the collective capital C church, we are God's plan A rescue mission to push back evil and spread the good news of Jesus throughout the world. We're plan A. We're actually the only plan. There's just one. So we can't screw it up. Now I wanna take us back to Matthew 5 though for just a minute because this passage of scripture isn't just a pep talk. Now, as much as I want to be a salty, bright warrior princess for Jesus, I mean, that sounds awesome, right? We can't just pick out the passages of the scripture that make us feel good on the inside. We have to read the whole thing. So this isn't just a pep talk, it's a warning. It's a warning to us as Christians. In Matthew 5, 13, it says, but if the salt should lose its taste, how can it be made salty? It's no longer good for anything but to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. Another version says it becomes worthless. And then it says, no one lights a lamp and puts it under a basket. In the same way, let your light shine before others. Friend, you must be aware tonight that you can lose your saltiness and you can choose to hide your light. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to live a life that Jesus says is no longer good for anything. So the question is, how do we stay salty? How do we let our light shine bright? And the answer is holiness, holiness. Romans 12, therefore brothers and sisters, in view of the mercies of God, I urge you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true worship. Do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may discern what is the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. Holiness matters. It's important. And holiness just means that we are living a life that is set apart from the world. We're living a life that is reserved to give God glory. Holy living, a life dedicated to righteousness, built on God's truth, bringing glory to God is what makes us salt and light. It's what makes us different from the world. You don't put chicken on chicken to make it taste better. (laughs) You put salt because it's different. We need to be different from the world. It's how we stand out. It's how we push back evil. And I have an honest question for you tonight. How do you expect to change the world if you look just like it? Now, when I say the word holiness, I am aware that it probably stirs up all kinds of emotions in people all across this room. Maybe you've had a bad experience and somebody blamed it on holy living. So I just wanna like clear the air right now and talk about like 
what I mean and what the Bible means when we're talking about holiness tonight, okay? Because there's two extremes. If you hear the word holiness and you automatically think legalism, you're like, oh no, ew, gross, no thank you, I like to go bowling. Or you're on the other extreme and you're like, holiness, oh yeah, I'll get there. You know, like grace, bro. It's like <laughs> grace and love and yeah, you know, it's like God doesn't really care about what's going on in the inside. Grace. So you're either like the extreme, you're like, oh no, I don't want to deal with holiness because of legalism. Or you're like, I don't have to deal with holiness because of grace. So let's just clear up any confusion right from the start. Holiness is not just a moral list of do's and don'ts. It's so much more than that. We are not going to turn into a bunch of Pharisees up in here who are just concerned with outward performance. Jesus cares about our heart. Holiness is not a list of religious behavioral expectations. When my grandma was growing up, they didn't go bowling. They weren't allowed to play cards. They did all kinds of weird stuff. I mean, I don't know where you get bowling is a sin in the Bible. I mean, like, that is like a stretch. <laughs> but if you went bowling and somebody in the church found out, you were in trouble. And that is not what we are talking about tonight, okay? Holiness is also not an unattainable perfection because that just brings weight and guilt and discouragement and fear. And that is not the God that we serve. So let's just shake off the weight of silly rules, <laughs> shake off the weight of self-righteous religious judgment, because we're not playing that game either. And let's talk about for a minute what holiness is. It is a heart and mind set on Jesus. It is taking the word of God seriously. And it is the ability and willingness to say no to sin. But in order to understand our holiness, we first must understand that God is holy. The holiness of God is his most revealed attribute in all of scripture. It's mentioned over 600 times throughout the Bible. The holiness of God refers to the absolute moral purity of God. So how is God's holiness revealed to us? In everything that he does, everything he thinks, desires, speaks, and does is completely holy in every way. So God is not only perfectly good, he is the very source and standard of goodness. So goodness never changes because God never changes. The same truth applies to all of God's characteristics. Holiness is his very nature. It's who he is. Isaiah 6, 3 says, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of heaven's armies. The whole earth is filled with his glory. God is so holy that saying it one time was not enough. <laughs> holy, holy, holy had to capture the depth and the weight of who God is. I loved this quote from R.C. Sproul, it says, only once in sac sacred scripture is an attribute of God elevated to the third degree. Only once is a characteristic of God mentioned three times in succession. The Bible says that God is holy, holy, holy. Not that he is merely holy or even holy, holy. <laughs> he is holy, holy, holy. <laughs> I think they're trying to get a point across the Bible never says that God is love, 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 or mercy, 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 or wrath, 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 or justice, justice, justice. It does say though that he is holy, 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 and the whole earth is filled with his glory. So because God is holy, 
There is no created being that is like him. Nothing can compare to him. He is complete perfection. We serve a God who is complete perfection. And only because of his holiness is there even a moral law for which every human is responsible. Only when we truly understand how holy God is can we see the depravity of our own sinful nature and how far below his moral standard we fall. The Bible says that all have sinned and fall short of his standard of holiness. Me, you, all of humanity. Romans 3.10 says, no one is righteous, not even one. So this is why I find it like a little shocking that several times throughout scripture it says, be holy because I am holy. Can you say that again, Lord? <laughs> How am I supposed to be holy like our holy God? It seems unattainable. It seems impossible. It would be like if I said to Lila when she was eight months old, you must be potty trained for I am potty trained. <laughs> It's just like not gonna happen. <laughs> we are in the middle of that. Pray for me, sisters. <laughs> but if holiness is humanly impossible, why does God command us to be holy? And the answer is really, it's actually simple. It's so that he can have a relationship with you. Pastor Ryan said it perfectly in his sermon yesterday. God is a personal God with a personal name who wants to have a personal relationship with you. This is true. The God of the universe, the creator of heaven and earth wants to have a personal relationship with you but we have to remember that he's holy. So he cannot, under any circumstance, tolerate sin. Habakkuk 1.13 says, talking about God, your eyes are too pure to look on evil. You cannot tolerate wrongdoing. Our sin, mankind's sin, is a problem that God has been solving since the beginning of time. When Adam and Eve sinned, their perfect relationship with God was broken and humans have been separated by sin from God ever since. Sin is the opposite of holiness. It is not just a list of things that we shouldn't do. Sin is a disastrous condition of the heart because a heart in sin is a heart in opposition to God. So our personal, relational God was not okay with his creation, mankind, being separate from him. He wanted to set us free from the bondage of sin. And he knew there had to be a perfect sacrifice to pay the price for our sins, so he sent Jesus. Jesus came to this earth to bring sight to the blind, hope to the hopeless, freedom from the bondage of sin. He died on the cross and he rose again to give you eternal life by restoring your relationship with God. And all of this, it all points to one truth. And maybe you never thought about it like this before, but Jesus died to make you holy. He died to make you holy. And without his holiness being transferred to you, a relationship with God would be impossible. Second Corinthians five says, he made him who knew no sin, Jesus, to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. The moment you give your life to Jesus, you are bought, brought out of darkness and into the light. 
You're forgiven, you're saved, you're restored relationship with God and you literally inherit and wear the holiness of God. It's what we call positional sanctification. Now sanctification is just a word that means to be set apart for a special purpose and to sanctify means to be made holy. So our positional sanctification is immediate. You can't earn it, you don't deserve it. It's a free gift so no one can boast. You are instantly saved from the ultimate penalty of sin. You are in Christ Jesus, a child of God. But hear me tonight. Even though we are made positionally holy as soon as we give our life to Jesus, becoming practically holy is a lifelong journey with several ups and downs. (laughs) And Jesus knew we were gonna need help with this. In John 14, Jesus said, and I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate who will never leave you. He is the Holy Spirit who leads you into all truth. Jesus sent the Holy Spirit to live inside of every believer to lead, guide, comfort, develop. And his main function is to make you more holy. The Holy Spirit helps you become all that Christ has declared you to be. We call this progressive sanctification. It's the process every believer goes through in which we are saved from the practice and power of sin. It's the process that makes us more like Jesus, makes us more holy. So, so far tonight, we've talked about everything God does to make us holy. Oh, and doesn't it feel so good? God does really everything to make us holy. And we have to remember as we go forward that it is foundational to our faith that we have to know we are not saved by anything we can do, only through God's grace. Positional sanctification is a gift to those who choose to believe. But when it comes to progressive sanctification, We do have a role that we play in that. Look at these scripture verses with me tonight. In Hebrews, it tells us to work at living a holy life. In 1 Timothy, it says, train yourself to be godly. In James, it says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. These are all action words. We play a part in this process, girls. So there are two things that are true, okay? Two things that are true. First, the Holy Spirit working in us and through us is what gives us the power to live a holy life and overcome sin. And it's only by his power that this is possible. But two, it is our responsibility to pursue and desire holiness. Both of these things are true at the same time. This is what marks us as true Christ followers. It's our responsibility to pursue holiness and so we must understand what could stand in the way of us becoming more holy. So what threatens your holiness? What threatens your holiness? Number one, ignorance. Ignorance can stop the process of becoming more holy. Because it's hard to pursue holiness if you don't know what a holy life looks like. You know, it's like the little details. We have the most access to God's word of any generation in history, yet we are the most biblically illiterate. And it's tragic. It's so sad to watch people walk through life struggling because they do not know what the word of God says. And you have to know tonight that ignorance is not an excuse to sin. Sin is sin whether you know it's sin or not. Now this is also where grace comes in. 
If you've been a Christian for five minutes, you're not gonna know all that the Bible says, and that's okay. That's where grace comes and covers us. But if you've been a Christian for five years and you've read your Bible three times in the last five years, that's a problem. It's a problem. In order to truly pursue holiness, you have to know what a holy life looks like. If I wanna know my husband better, I have to talk to him. I have to get to know him. Second, legalism. Legalism threatens our holiness. This is a spirit that says, as long as I'm doing the right thing on the outside, it doesn't matter what's on the inside. Hey guys, you're like really early. You're killing my vibe up here. So. <laughs> I was like debating, do I let it go? But I got some jokes up here that the slow music are just like not gonna fit, so. <laughs> so early tonight. <laughs> In closing, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, if you weren't here yesterday, you did not get that joke. <laughs> Number two, what threatens our, our holiness? Legalism. It's the spirit that says, as long as I'm doing the right thing on the outside, it doesn't matter what's on the inside. As long as I don't watch that kind of movie or use bad words or whatever you've decided is on your list of good behavior, you think you're okay. If you're only concerned with behavior modification, you've missed the whole point. Jesus is concerned with our heart. And legalism usually, mostly, always, produces <laughs> judgmental, Self-righteous Christians who are more concerned with the speck in their neighbor's eye than the log in their own. Number three, willful, willful disobedience. This is a big one. This is just a general lack of concern with the sin in your life. Listen, you cannot separate love for Jesus and obedience to his commands. They go together. Jesus said, if you love me, you will obey my commands. These are the people that come to church and they sit in the chair, start singing a song like, I surrender all. And they're singing it, but in their head, it's more like, all to Jesus. Yeah, I could sing that. I surrender mostly to him I freely give. I will ever love and trust him, except when I don't want to give up control, in his presence daily live on Sundays. I surrender all but I'm not gonna stop sleeping with my boyfriend. I surrender all, but there's no way I'm gonna start honoring my husband. All will partially to thee, my blessed savior. I surrender, kind of. <laughs> When I stand up here and sing that song, it sounds absolutely ridiculous, but that's how we live our lives. We come to church, we play the game, we say, oh, I surrender all to Jesus. 
And we are living in ongoing, unrepentant sin. And we've become okay with it. And I'm here to tell you tonight, girls, it is not okay. It is not okay to know God's truth, to know his ways and pretend like it doesn't matter. Holiness matters. Holy living matters. Now, hear me tonight. I'm not talking about making a mistake. I'm not talking about stumbling when you're trying. We all do that every single day. But I'm talking about you know it's a sin and you just don't care. Whatever sin you're holding on to tonight, give it to Jesus. Because listen, God can't and won't bless any area of your life that is not surrendered to him. Number four, selective apathy. This is an attitude that is casual towards sin we deem like not that big of a deal. You know, we all have them. Cause you know, grace, bro, it's like grace. It's like, oh yeah, I care about that sin. Like, oh, that, that sin's a big deal, like stealing. Oh, I would never, I would never do that. Oh, but gossiping, I mean like who doesn't do that, right? Or maybe you care about overcoming sins that are public, but not the sins that are private. Listen, Jesus died to set you free from the curse of all sin. Listen, all sin separates you from God, whether you deem it a big sin or not. It is something that needs to be surrendered to the Lord. Sins that we label not a big deal can and will create huge strongholds in our life. And they will cause you to become stuck. It can become a blind spot and it can hold you back from living a truly free and abundant life. And that's the life that Jesus wants you to have. Number five, that can threaten your holiness is guilt and shame. Maybe you're in the room tonight and you're hearing all of this talk about holiness and you just keep thinking, well, that could never be me. I could never be holy. I'm too broken. I'm too damaged. I've sinned too much. I'm too messed up. If you only knew the things I did, you would know. If you only knew how long I've been trapped in this sin, you would know that holiness is unattainable for me. Hear me clearly tonight, girls. When you turn to Jesus and ask him for forgiveness, you are made completely new, 100% clean. Your past no longer matters because Jesus paid the price for those sins. He is making all things new and this applies to the worst of the worst. All guilt and shame are completely gone because there is no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. So you can leave your guilt and your shame at the feet of Jesus and turn and walk away free. Now I know this is a room full of women who desire to live a holy life. I believe that with all of my heart. We are women who want to look like Jesus, who want to be the salt and the light of the world. And this is something that you have to decide to do. But you also have to know that it, this is not just a list of goals or resolutions, okay? I'm so bad at goals and resolutions. Like we have a, a communication channel that we use in our for all of our staff, it's called Slack. You probably use it at work too. And we have a Slack channel that's private so the boys can't see it. That, that's called um, Beautiful Goals. And 
like if the staff girls come and they're like, hey, you know, like I'm gonna start working out or I wanna eat more healthy or I'm gonna do these things, like they'll put it in that channel. I looked today and the last time anyone posted in that channel was in 2020. <laughs> So that's how we're doing on our goals. <laughs> but that's not what we're talking about tonight. It's not just a list of goals. Jay Adams says, you may have sought and tried to obtain instant godliness. Wouldn't that be nice? But there is no such thing. We want somebody to give us three easy steps to godliness and we'll take them next Friday and be godly. <laughs> the trouble is, godliness doesn't come that way. We've all experienced this, right? Right? Yes. Yeah. We decide, I'm not gonna do that anymore. I decided today, never again. <laughs> like 30 minutes later, you're like, darn it. <laughs> I was really gonna try this time. Or like, yeah, I'm, I'm gonna do it this time. I'm never gonna look at that again. Or I'm not gonna talk that way or whatever you struggle with. And five minutes later, you do it again. Listen girls, you're not alone. We all do that. We all do that. The apostle Paul did that. We all do things that we don't wanna do and we don't do the things we do wanna do. It's part of the process. And we have to know that and remember that progressive sanctification is a process, okay? It's a lifelong journey that will never be complete this side of heaven. When we fall short, God's grace is there. When we mess up, we confess, we repent, and we keep trying to be holy. His mercies are new every morning. But we constantly pursue holiness. We pursue it, we chase after it, we desire it, we long for it. And we can't wait for the day when our holiness is perfected in heaven. But on this side of heaven, today and tomorrow and the next day, how do you pursue holiness? Number one, you have a surrendered spirit. It all starts here, girls. A surrendered spirit to the Lord. It's a heart posture that wants to be more like Jesus. We know, okay, I know I'm not perfect like him, and I'm never going to be, but man, I wanna be more like him. And in five years, I wanna be so much more like him than I am today. And in 10 years, I wanna look back at who I am today and not even recognize myself because I've been pursuing holiness. I've been walking in godliness and I don't look like myself anymore because I look more like Jesus. That's a surrendered spirit. It involves listening to the Holy Spirit and actually responding when you feel convicted. When you feel convicted, you get to decide what you do with that. Do you ignore it? Or do you say, okay, I'm feeling the conviction of the Holy Spirit and it's, it might be causing some tension in my soul. It might be stirring up some feelings I don't like, but I'm going to listen. And I'm gonna say, okay, I know I just sinned and I'm gonna confess my sins. I'm gonna ask God to forgive me and I'm gonna keep moving forward. A surrendered spirit is not a one-time event. It's a daily response to the Holy Spirit moving in your life. Number two, we pursue holiness with obedience in action. Obedience to God's word is so important, girls. 
We have to know God's ways and then we actually have to say yes to them. We wanna be doers of the word, not just hearers of the word. word. Listen, what does this practically look like? I'm gonna say it real simple. You just say no to sin. You say no to sin. Now, remember, you have the power and the authority to do this through Jesus. Through the power of Jesus living inside of you, you can resist temptation. If it's just a goal on a list that's in your closet from four years ago, it's not gonna do you any good. But if you're facing temptation and you go, God, I wanna be holy and I know that I'm being tempted to sin right now and I need your power to come in me to help me resist what I'm wanting to do, he will show up. It's obedience to the word of God. Number three, accountability. This is so important. There is nothing the devil loves more than a Christian that is trying to walk through life alone. You are an easy target. I'm just gonna tell it straight tonight. You need a friend who will tell you when you're acting a fool. And then when they tell you, you need to be like, oh, you're right. (laughs) I don't like it. I rebuke you in Jesus' name, but then yes, yes, my friends, I see what you're saying. Listen, if you don't have a friend in your life who can have an honest conversation with you, about the sin in your life, you need to find one. Luckily, we're in a room of thousand women tonight. (laughs) Who would love to be your best friend? (laughs) If you don't wanna walk through life alone, I promise at this church, you don't have to. And that is not just something fancy we say say from the stage, we mean it. Join a life group. They just started, by the way. Join a life group. Serve on a team. Find a friend that you can be vulnerable with. It is vital to your walk with Jesus. It's so important. You cannot do it alone. Fourth, how do you pursue holiness? Discipline. Discipline can like feel the tension was just like, oh, I don't like that word. (laughs) We have to take holiness seriously and it's hard work. Now again, I've said this already, but I'm gonna say it again because I don't want you to misunderstand me tonight. Don't confuse discipline for legalism, okay? Listen, all legalism emphasizes discipline, but not all discipline is legalism. They are not the same thing. Legalism points out how you are wrong and discipline helps you get better. Discipline in Christianity is treated like a dirty word. It's like, oh no, I'm gonna just like do my thing and like don't tell me what to do. (laughs) Lila the other day was (laughs) being sweet I'm lying, she was being a brat. (laughs) Lord, I just lied, forgive me. She was being a total brat. (laughs) And I was telling her what to do. And she looked at me straight at the face, in the face. And she goes, mom, I hate when she calls me mom, I'm not ready for that. (laughs) She goes, mom, I don't have to listen to you. You're a bad frog. (laughs) let me tell you 
She got disciplined for that. <laughs> and jury's still out, but I bet she'll never say that to me again. <laughs> That's how discipline works. And we need it in our lives. We need discipline. Nobody treats discipline as a negative thing when it comes to fitness or finances, right? In that light, we're like, oh yeah, discipline. I'm gonna get fit. <laughs> we care about those outcomes. We'll embrace that discipline. But when it comes to spiritual discipline, we resist. That's right. That's good. But think about an elite athlete for a second. Do you think they have discipline? When they're trying to advance to the next level, when they're trying to win the game, they'll take critique. They'll take anything that will help them get better. They're gonna work hard. They're gonna work every day. They're gonna work for hours every day. And they'll tweak whatever needs to be tweaked. They'll work it out. They'll ask for help because they want to win. And we've been called to win a race too. We've been called to run our race for Jesus. And girls, it takes discipline. What does this look like practically? Spiritual discipline. Read your Bible. When I like list what they actually are, it like doesn't really seem that hard. But when we're living it out in our daily life, it can be such a challenge. And I'm not standing up here tonight telling you that I have it all figured out. but we need to be disciplined in our spiritual walk. Read the Bible like every day. Read it for yourself. Understand it for yourself. Come to church every Sunday. You will, you will grow if you come to church every single Sunday, especially at this church. Worship. Amen. You're struggling? Worship. Amen. Be careful what you allow into your soul. Listen, I'm not talking about legalism. I think I've made that very clear tonight. But it matters what you put on the inside of you. What TV shows are you watching? What music are you listening to? What have you desensitized yourself to because it's so common today, but it's so against the word and the ways of God? It matters, girls. It matters. Holiness brings us closer to God. It allows us to fulfill our purpose on earth. And listen, it keeps us out of harm's way. Listen. Listen, just like Pastor Ryan has said through our whole Ten Commandments series, when you hear God say, don't, hear him say, don't harm yourself. God wants what's best for you. And his ways are what's best for you. And I don't think it's a coincidence that in the armor of God, we wear a breastplate of righteousness. What does a breastplate do? It guards your heart. It, gui it guards all your vital organs. If you're on a battlefield and you're not wearing a breastplate, you're in trouble. And guess what, girls? We're on a battlefield every single day, everywhere we go, we are fighting a battle against sin and evil. And if we are not wearing the righteousness of God, we will not survive.
You'll make it to heaven, but you'll probably live hell on earth. And that's not the life Jesus died to give you. He wants you to walk in his righteousness, in his ways, in his holiness, every day progressing, becoming more like Jesus and looking less like the world. More like Jesus, less like the world. More like holiness, less like sin. And the more you walk in holiness, the saltier you become and the brighter your light. Satan is on a rampage against holiness. He always has been and he always will be. And it doesn't threaten him when you're just casually walking through life. Complacent, not caring, just, just another day. He'll leave you alone then. Which is like, that's not what you want. It's like, sounds good, but it's not. As women, as followers of Jesus, we should be a threat to the enemy. I want to take as many people to heaven with me as possible. And I want to get to heaven someday. And I want Jesus to look at me in the face and say, well done, good and faithful servant. So I just want to ask you a simple question tonight. What would happen if you stopped being consumed with your desires, your wants, your lists, your accomplishments, your needs, and you just cried out to God, God, make me more holy. Make me more like Jesus. It's what he wants for us, and it's what we should want too. In response to this message tonight, we're just going to sit for a minute. Because this has to be a personal response between you and God. Only you know how you should respond to this message. And listen, we are all in the process of becoming more sanctified. And wherever you're at on your journey tonight, I wanna encourage you to just take holiness more seriously. There is nobody in this room who has it all figured out. There is no one in this room who's like, well, yeah, but I'm good. We all have an area where we can grow. It's not by our power, but his. You just close your eyes tonight for a moment. Before we respond to this message, this really only applies to you if you are a Christ follower. And so I can't go any further tonight unless I give every single girl in this room an opportunity to give their life to Jesus tonight. And listen, as I'm talking about holiness and God's ways and the way God wants us to live and that it's because he cares for us and that we can only be made holy because of Jesus and that he came and he died on the cross for our sins. If you have not accepted Jesus yet, all of this applies to you if you make the decision to give your life to Jesus. And I just wanna encourage you tonight it's the best decision that you could ever make. It's the most important decision you could ever make. So if that's you tonight, you can just pray this prayer with me. Jesus, thank you for coming to this earth and dying on the cross to pay the price for my sins and rising again so that I can be made holy and have a right relationship with God. And Lord, I have been living a life far from you. So tonight, Lord, I accept your free gift of salvation. 
And Lord, I give you my heart and I'm asking that you would make me clean, that you would forgive me of my sins. And from this day forward, I choose to follow you. Now for everybody else in the room, we're gonna just sit in the presence of our holy God tonight. And I want you to be vulnerable with him. Be honest with him. What are you struggling with? What is holding you back? What do you need to surrender to God? What sin has a stronghold in your life that you have not surrendered control of yet? We're going to quietly sing for just a minute. And I just want you to spend a few minutes in prayer, talking to your Father God. To Jesus I surrender all. To Him I freely give. And I will ever Love and trust him in his presence daily. And all to Jesus I tonight and sing this as a commitment to our Lord and Savior.
we surrender everything to you tonight. God, we declare that you are holy, you are worthy, you deserve our praise. And God, we want to be women tonight who are committed to holy living. Lord, who will seek after you in everything that we do, who will daily pursue holiness. Lord, we wanna be women who look more like Jesus tomorrow than we do today. Women who look more like Jesus in five years than we do today. And Lord, we are saying that we are committing to surrendering our lives to you. We love you, we honor you, we worship you. Come on girls, let's worship him tonight as a sign of surrender. 